Welcome, friends, to a very special episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I have Thomas Smale, who is the founder and CEO of FE International. Uh, FE is a tech-focused M&A advisory firm that specializes in one to hundred million dollar exit sector. His team closed over fifteen hundred deals with a combined value of over fifty billion dollars throughout their careers. And they worked with investors and founders all over the globe. Um, their experience goes back to early 2000s. And they specialize in businesses in SaaS, e-commerce, and uh, kind of digital media content categories. So, Thomas, welcome to the pod. Excited to hear your story. Hey, Alex. Thanks so much for inviting me on. Great. Well, Thomas, you know, obviously, um, many folks... Well, myself, I would say, don't start was a business. Uh, b- the business was an idea to sell it uh, immediately, right? We want to, you know, we want to build a legacy. But some businesses have constraints, right? They operate in certain markets. Uh, things happen to the owners uh, that you know their financial situation changes, and they need to exit the business. Describe to me what's kind of the like for small business owners. What are the biggest reasons that they're choosing? to engage with you and to pursue the M&A uh, exit strategy for their business, or maybe you're doing recapitalizations in other areas. And just for your context for everybody, uh, Thomas um, uh, and I met through a shared customer. He was, you know, has raving reviews from that shared customer. And so, you know, I'm actually here like super fired up to learn from Thomas uh, because while we are building a business for hundred years, I think actually a lot of our customers um, are built, you know, have a different focus and we love that and respect that. And we want to make sure that they have access to ideas from Thomas. So Thomas, over to you on kind of how this could help entrepreneurs. Yeah. So I think the first thing to consider is that every single person has to exit their business at some stage. That does not necessarily mean the business cannot continue, but as an individual, you at some stage will exit. The, the business unless, unless we it, drink the potion of infinite life is that is that like the well one it, yeah unless we're assuming that that could happen um which means that everyone should have an, some form of exit strategy even if it's not right now and also a lot of people have the plan never to sell which is fine and, and often the best businesses are ones where the owner has not been doing things to get it ready they've just been running it as they want to run it for a hundred years that period um, might be, but often when people do decide to sell, it's because there's been a change in personal circumstances, financial circumstances, opportunity. But it might be, hey, I've actually got a better idea. I have this new business which is doing and it's growing more than I thought. So I'm going to sell my current business. Um, it's usually, so it's usually one of those three things. A lot of people we work with. And I always believe that every entrepreneur should have a specific financial exit goal in mind. And if it's your first business, it makes sense to sell when you hit that level. And hopefully that level is uh, what I would describe as financial freedom, or ideally the level above that would be generational wealth. So you and your kids, if you have kids and your kids' kids never have to work again if they don't want to would be generational i think financial freedom is probably a bit more simple than that it's do you want to buy a buy a house give some debt to pay off maybe it's an existing mortgage maybe it's college loans or credit cards or whatever it might be and being in a position where you and your spouse or your family if you're married and have kids also don't have to work again and just have that baseline level of financial security and then with your next business and Every entrepreneur can build a, a, a new business. There's not, I've never met anyone who has built a successful business who's only ever been able to do it once. Then once you sell your first business, you've then created a kind of financial platform where you can g- go do it again. I think a lot of people run businesses for too long and never, I'm, not, I'm all for delayed gratification. So not taking every cent out of the business as you go along. But I think it's important to get out, get some cash out when you can, and offer an exit as best way to do it. So usually the people we work to, just very 
long answer to your short question, but the short answer is people sell when they want to get some cash out of the, the business and often an exit is the best way to, to do that. And there could be many catalysts for that. It might be they've been approached by a buyer. It might be family member is sick. Um, it might be they have a new opportunity. There's there's lots of different things that can cause that, but that's ultimately why people decide to sell. Well, and you know, we know the SaaS ecosystem really well and we support digital content folks as well. So obviously in the world that we live in right now, at the end of 2023, there's a little bit of a bubble bursting effect in in some of the uh, kind of inflated valuations in the sort of the VC game that is the more popularly uh, covered game in the press. Um, so tell us, you know, how is that impacting your business? You've been like growing tremendously and the, the deal volume that you've been doing uh, was in FE International. So what are you seeing now that sort of the trends and, you know, in uh, your lovely report that you produce uh, that's emerging that's changing the dynamics and making more businesses think about the exits or not think about the exits in this new environment. Yeah. So I think, uh, again, the caveat is where a lot of the slowdown has been is deals in, in the say hundred million to multi-billion dollar range. If you have a small business and it's profitable or has a path to profitability there's always been demand for acquiring those companies, and that has not gone away. In the US alone, there's around $4 trillion in dry powder with private equity firms right now. And while that's not necessarily all going into tech M&A, that's $4 trillion that needs to be deployed, either investing into businesses or um, acquiring businesses outright. So your $10 million business you built or your $50 million business you built does not make a scratch on that that total amount so context big deals may have slowed down smaller transactions really have not assuming you built a good business where m a has gone away at the lower level is companies that previously might have been losing money every month and a speculative acquirer might have come in maybe they were strategic or maybe they were borrowing money very cheaply and could make the the deal work so those deals aren't happening anymore so if you're burning cash, it's very difficult to sell at the moment. Um, because basically and- the buyers are on themselves under pressure to deliver profitability. They may not have uh, as many resources right now as the you know the funding environment has constrained. So- well, and also just interest rates in most yeah. countries in the world are now higher. So it's more yeah. expensive to borrow money if you use debt to buy yeah. a business, which means that your required returns are higher. If you had 10- million dollars in cash a couple of years ago in the US and you wanted to just keep it in say T-bills like treasury bonds you would your yield would essentially be nothing if you do that right now so what November 2023 your yield is somewhere around 5.5 percent and you don't have to do anything so at the very least you need to be able to beat that kind of the threshold rate is as much yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so why would you buy a business for say 50 times multiple if the return isn't that so a lot of a lot of people literally look at it that simply i i call it i describe it as spreadsheet spreadsheet negotiation a lot of people will just look at the numbers obviously there's more to it than that if you can quadruple a business it's irrelevant what you pay for it because you're going to grow it and it doesn't really matter so i'm of the belief so strategic that, like, is still strategic Strate- strategic is still strategic but the opportunistic math is becoming much harder uh, it, it, is, it, it, exactly, and particularly the financial math is becoming a lot harder if you have a business that's not that profitable. If you're profitable and making money, those deals are still happening exactly the same as they were two years ago. It's been essentially no change in demand for those, nor have we seen any slowdown at all. Buyers are just getting a little bit more disciplined, but buyers are also getting a little bit more creative, which means some of the their billion dollar private equity fund. If we turned up with a Fifty million dollar deal and put it in front of them two years ago, they would have laughed us out of the room and said, "No, we're not looking at this. It's too small." But now a lot of these funds will be looking at. At the moment, we have a, a deal we're representing around one hundred and twenty five million valuation. They'll happily look at a deal at that level now. Years gone by, they wouldn't. They'd say oh, it's too small. We have to be deploying at least two hundred and fifty million per transaction or whatever that that might be. So a lot of these funds are coming down. 
which means that if you have a rel- say relatively small business, say below a hundred million valuation, there's a lot of demand out there for companies like yours. Got it. So this is really helpful. Uh, you know, my my take as an entrepreneur, and maybe you could help me interpret this, is that uh, you know I get pro- I'm thinking like four types of inbounds uh, uh, kind of outbound directed to me spam you know so one is like people want to give me leads uh of competitive you know competitive users there's like offshore development <laughs> shops that are they're going to me uh there are lead gen services and the fourth one is pe shops that look at our growth on some sort of whether it's g2 or another kind of parameters that they're identifying and they're kind of reaching out aggressively trying to connect to the entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, what's your take on kind of what should entrepreneurs do when they get that sort of inbound interest? And, you know, some of it could be, you know, maybe we're a little bit on the more venture backed kind of, but still kind of scrappy project you know kind of version of that so it's attractive to pe shops some businesses could be smaller they may get brokers coming in you know guide an entrepreneur to what to do right do you invest your time in building these relationships taking an analyst or associate or vp meeting you ignore it and wait until you engage they engage you uh in you know in around the trend time of a transaction uh coming closer you know, what What have you seen the most successful entrepreneurs do with that level of inbound interest from PE shops? I think overall, it always makes sense to have a conversation with someone who's credible. I mean, as an entrepreneur, I, I probably get 500 cold emails a day, literally emails, LinkedIn, all sorts of different mediums of reaching calls, whatever. Mm-hmm. So it does not necessarily mean reply to all 500, but credible approaches are usually quite obvious when they're credible so maybe off the 500 emails I get a day I would say it always amazes me having been an entrepreneur for kind of 15 years now how bad outreach is 99% of outreach is terrible so you can tell very quickly what's good outreach particularly when it and that same thing applies to investors or potential acquirers of your business if it's like hey Alex I'm John I'm an associate at uh, X Capital, and we're looking to buy SaaS businesses. Are you interested in a conversation? That's probably going to be a waste of time. If it's Hey Alex, I'm I'm John at X Capital. I've been following your Relay Two journey for a while. I really like how you've built the product out and the integrations you have with X Y Z. We recently closed a deal in the space with a company that specializes in xyz um typically the odd average deal size is kind of five to ten million dollars and we're looking for companies that generate at least a million dollars in ar are you interested in the conversation if you meet that criteria then that probably makes sense to have a conversation um just replying to anyone who cold emails in it's probably going to be a waste of time um it's always worth having those conversations so generally speaking private equity firms that are cold email like that are not going to be the best buy of your business, you need to run a competitive process and get multiple offers on the table. I think where you do hear about some success there is if you have a true st- strategic acquirer and they come along and acquire you, that might make sense. So I don't know your business that well, but that might be Darmesh at HubSpot emails you and says, hey, Alex, love what you're doing with Relay2. This would be a great fit for the the HubSpot platform, I think I use yeah. to find good use that. Are you interested in a conversation about acquisition? Here's some recent deals we did in the space. You've probably heard of them. Um, and then cite some of the deals they've done. That kind of approach would make sense and you should have that conversation. Strategic buyers often have the ability to pay more. That said, 99.9% of entrepreneurs will never be lucky enough to sell their business to someone who cold emails them. So if you are ever thinking about selling, do actually probably need to hire an M&A firm to run a process for you and reach out to hundreds and thousands of buyers and get multiple conversations on the table. Uh, And if you do get lucky and you get that true inbound interest, which is willing to pay more than market value for your business, I am very much unashamedly a a capitalist. I always think you should take money and go build something else. There's not a 
there's no shame in that and there's no limit to good ideas out there and also what i think a lot of people don't think about when they say they're not going to sell second time round, it's a lot easier because you already have a bit of reputation if you're mm-hmm. doing some sort of cold email email or contact you you're more credible um if you want to build your business by going to speak at conferences Almost any conference will have you on stage if you've exited your business for eight or nine figures. Um, you, if you want to get investment, it's much much easier if you've done it before. Um, it's just so many things that are easier if you've done it before, and just that financial element. If you do not have the stress of how do I pay my mortgage, how do I pay my rent, how do I, yeah, kind of put food on the table for my kids, then I think that makes decision making easier as well. So sometimes taking a deal makes sense if a good one comes along so it's always worth having the conversation but i think as a business owner i think it's your kind of fiduciary responsibility to your company to have those conversations but at the same time it's also your responsibility to run the business so you don't want to if you're not planning on selling you don't want to get distracted spending 25 hours a week speaking to quite honestly like random kids sat in a new york office calling companies trying to buy them yeah. Well, actually, so let's help let's help entrepreneurs who are listening to this and folks on those entrepreneurial teams think about, you know, what can they do to increase their optionality? Because obviously, like what, you know, Business School 101 will teach you is that if you don't have to sell your business, it's much easier to have a, you know, a lot of attractive options that make it available for sale, right? If the business is doing well. Um, if you have uh, strategics, like you mentioned, that may uh, increase your multiples from, you know, compared to what financial uh, acquirers may be interested in because of the potential synergies of the two businesses. And so guide us a little bit about what do you see as the best entrepreneurs and the best entrepreneurial teams that are doing to create maximum optionality, and especially in this environment where venture funding may not be as easily available especially at these later stages. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there seems to be a lot more premium on obviously profitability and tangibility versus, hey, you know, I have a lot of potential, you know, I have a big vision, I haven't delivered on it yet, but believe me, I will, right? Type of stories, which, you know, we're, we've been kind of inundated with a little bit in the ecosystem. Yeah, maybe this sounds overly simplistic, but ultimately you just need to focus on building a good business. I think the worst thing you can do is come watch me speak at a conference on stage talking about valuation drivers, which I'll often talk about and say, oh, Thomas said, here are five things to increase the value of my business. I'm going to go spend all my time just working on these specific metrics. But every business is different. Yes, there are certainly things that I can present and we have from all of our data that says these specific things will make your business worth more. That doesn't necessarily apply to every business. And they are not necessarily relevant to what you're doing or what your skill set is. So if you have the option of, one of the things I talk about is reducing revenue churn or increasing net revenue retention. Uh, yes, if you own a SaaS business or a software business, that's probably always a metric metric you should be focused on. But if you have also have the opportunity to grow your revenue by 100% instead by focusing on a new marketing channel that's working really well. It's much better to just double your revenue of your business than increase, you know, sorry, increase your the net margins. revenue retention. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So making those marginal improvements is great, but ultimately to build a business that's sellable, revenue growth and just the absolute size of your business it is important. It's much better to have a $10 million, talking hypothetical, $10 yeah. million dollar ARR business with 10% revenue churn than it is to have a $2 million ARR business with zero revenue churn. Because yes, technically your business is, has lower revenue churns. That's great. That's a check in the box, but the other business is five times bigger. So I think it's important to think about what drives valuation, but at the same time also focus on what builds a, a good business the bigger your business is the faster it's growing the more it's going to be worth it really is kind of as simple as as simple as that and if you can do it in a profitable way that's that's even better 
So yes, there are definitely some metrics. I could talk offline to any of your listeners and say, hey, here are some things specific to your business you need to focus on. But day to day, you focus on building a good business. That's ultimately something that someone wants to buy. No one wants to buy a business that's been purpose built, purpose planned to sell. Like, hey, I built this, I launched this business two years ago. My plan was always just to sell it. Does that work if you are selling a 50K valuation product on a marketplace that's kind of pre built? You're making $500 a month. Will someone come along and buy your project? Yes, absolutely. Does that work if you're selling for $5 million or $50 million? Absolutely not. So you very much need to change the mindset and focus on building a, a good business. So that's, I think, my general philosophy there. I think this is really helpful because I, I think, you know, what one of the things that I found annoying in, in business school classes is they kind of, they start, they put a bunch of MBAs and kind of start, they all kind of start thinking about, well, you know, let's plan for the exit. And, and I think you can, there's almost, how would I put it? There's just, first, you need to have a suspension of disbelief uh, a little bit and kind of just take that leap and, you know, believe that you can do something, create something out of nothing, redefine uh, your space, ideally, you know, as as you know, the businesses that are shaping and creating new categories tend to capture more of the value, um, you know, in in, the, in that overall category, whether they go IPO or exit or whatever is the strategy. Uh, but I think th those folks that are kind of writing the exit slides before they started the business, that kind of that would worry me, right? Because it's sort of a, like kind of says well when 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 you have troubles when you have challenges you're going to take your eyes off the ball you're going to sell quickly and it's not like to your point it's not that you don't want to have the optionality and you don't want to you know keep it in the back of your mind that it may be like not the perfect opportunity but if you start with that at the very beginning it sounds like you'll you'll make a bunch of suboptimal decisions that will destroy your M&A opportunity or or growth opportunities is that what i'm hearing thomas yeah, I'd say that's a pretty fair reflection. It's de so it's definitely important to think about. You definitely should not go into a business and say, I'm never going to sell it, so I don't care. Yeah. You also shouldn't go in and say, all I'm thinking about is how do I make a million dollars as fast as possible. That doesn't work. But So the reason you should definitely not build your business without any plan is then you're essentially just relying on luck. You're relying on a buyer coming along and being like, hey, Alex, I'm going to buy your business. Love what you've built. It's just I've just raised a billion dollars for my company. It just so happens we need to make an acquisition like yours. Uh, we have cash burning a hole in your pocket. We want to buy a business. Does that happen to some people? Yes. Does that make you kind of famous in the world of successful entrepreneurs? Yes, because you can go and talk about how you sold your business for a bunch of money. But will that happen for the majority? Absolutely not. So you shouldn't go out there with no plan at all. Yeah. Um, but also, <clears throat> I think if your entire focus is just building a business you can sell, it's not necessarily to make some optimal decisions i think you just build a bad product and you cut yeah. corners you're like oh maybe we shouldn't hire this extra person because that adds expense and then that will reduce our multiple when we sell so why don't we just not hire them or yeah. why don't we not pay bonuses this year or let's not go to that conference all of those kind of things i think there's a there's a fine balance between not thinking about it at all and thinking a little bit. Um, yeah. And, and Thomas, like one of the things that's your, uh, on your radar screen is that you probably have one of the largest deal flows in this sort of SMB kind of segment, like broadly speaking. And some of those are not that small, right? Like the, at the exit value that you work with, but it's sort of, you've started, it was a smaller, you've, you're, you're doing much larger opportunities now. So what do you see? We've talked about some of the flaws in thinking that could lead you a little bit astray. What are what are other things that you see that are like deal killers or, you know, kind of opportunity killers for entrepreneurs, right? Like where, like, like if you just planned a little bit more in advance or kind of just had some advice from a person was pattern matching of your caliber, you know, they could potentially avoid. Let's say the number one thing we see where someone has built a unsellable business is they had a sellable business, they had a great business, and then for whatever reason, the business has started declining. And they said, oh, we're never going to sell it. It's fine. It's doing great. And a lot of businesses, particularly early on, 
not necessarily luck. I'm not really a big believer in luck. I think you make your own luck. But some businesses will just do well early on. Don't need much marketing. Don't need much investment. The product is fine. You find a good marketing channel. No one's really competing with you. And you can grow quite quickly to, say, a couple of million dollars in ARR. I've seen many, many, many companies that have done that. And then what happens is to say, well, this is this is great. I'm making a bunch of money. Um, I don't really want to manage a team, so I'm not going to bother hiring anyone. Uh, I assume the business will just keep going. And then what often happens is the business starts declining. And when the business starts declining, it's much harder. At least my personal experience is it's much harder than people think to turn a declining business around. Even if you're declining 1% year on year, that can often be really hard to turn around and could be a disproportionate amount of effort, particularly where the business owner has fundamentally underinvested. So they've not invested into marketing, so their site has no organic traffic um, or no social media following, no paid ad campaigns at work or whatever it might be. Um, they don't want to manage any people, so there's no team, there's no there's no developer. It's entirely reliant on the founder to do the development work. Um, they they just have one marketing channel because it worked for a while and now it stopped working. Those businesses are really difficult to sell and it's just because it's been left too late. So once it starts declining, that's the hardest type of business to sell. Not necessarily impossible, but you get a significantly worse valuation significantly less by demand for a business that's declining versus growing. And that's the number one thing we see time and time again. We've offered, or we still offer free valuations to anyone that comes to us. So if you have a company that's a fit for us, we'll put together a valuation for you today. We then spend years and years often following up, checking in, see how the business is doing. Mm -hmm. The number one reason why businesses end up not selling or the founder never comes around is because the business has started declining and they don't really know how to get it back on track. So I'd say that is not the only reason we see, but probably the primary reason we see for businesses that don't sell or aren't sellable ultimately. So this is really interesting. So what you're describing is really, it's like plateau that kind of starts like even over time declining as, you know, maybe competition enters or things get saturated and you know, if I kind of hear you, the plat it, the plateau may happen, but it may happen. It depends on wh which size of the business you are in, right? Like if you're, you know, used up your network or one channel, that could be one of the reasons. Um, maybe you haven't adjusted your ideal customer profile to expand and grow could be another reason uh, for some businesses. But I think what I'm hearing is, you know, if you have you know, if plan A is working, you should be thinking what's the kind of plan B uh, kind of for the next phase of growth, not wait and just milk that plan A, uh, you know, that, that that's working, right? Always have like the next level of growth that you expect and, you know, for your business to avoid that type of situation. Is that, is that an accurate kind of thing that people could start, start doing? Yeah, exactly right. I think it's easy to get complacent particularly early on, and I'd say most people I see that happen are on their way to their first million. And mm. I'm not saying the, f the first million is like definitely the hardest, but in other ways it can be the easiest because you don't necessarily need a team or you can get away with a very small team. You don't necessarily need multiple marketing channels. You don't necessarily need particularly good metrics like churn, whether that's customer churn or revenue churn. You don't necessarily need to optimize pricing. You don't have to be selling enterprise plans. So you can get to a million. And a lot of people say get, not necessarily cocky, but they get a bit complacent. Like, well, this is great. Is this going to continue growing to 10 million ARR? And I'm not really going to need much, much more. But the reality is almost no businesses get to 10 million ARR with that same profile. Like, so they Basically, need to change no their strategy, change their team. You, you have to invest. And then where a lot of people fall down, and this is what happens, is you get lifestyle creep or like spend creep. So, hey, I'm now making $30,000 a month personally. You find a way to spend $30,000 a month personally. Buy a new car, you go on a nice vacation, you, you buy a nice house. That goes away. And then they're like, well, for me to grow, I need to 
hire someone, but then I only have 20,000 a month personally, so I can't afford my mortgage. So actually, maybe I'm just not going to invest in in that person. Um, or if they decide they want to, your business then gets diseconomies of scale. So people think, oh, it gets kind of cheaper to run your business relatively as you grow. But my experience is actually the opposite because speaking from FE perspective, for example, when we were five people, you don't need HR, you, you probably don't need an office. And if you have an office, you don't need an office manager. Uh, you don't need a full-time mm-hmm. accountant. There's a lot of roles that administratively have to exist at eight figures revenue that definitely do not have to exist at seven figures revenue. Um, so there's a lot of new expenses and a lot of founders we see are reluctant to invest what's needed into growing their business. They kind of they hit this kind of plateau and they don't get past the plateau because they've got comfortable with their lifestyle. And usually the thing, it's not necessarily costs, it's the idea of managing people. If you can learn how to manage Because it's a technical people, founder, they're kind of a little bit like they want to stay in their comfort zone. They exactly. That. So that's yeah. really common. Mm-hmm. It's not even necessarily technical founders. As they, lots of founders don't like the idea of managing people. And I'd say if you speak to if I go to a peer event of entrepreneurs in the 10 to 100 million revenue range and we share our biggest challenges, I'd say almost 100% of people or founders of that level or CEOs of that level, their challenge will be people. So hiring, recruitment, retention, training, all of those kind of things. It's not, oh, how do I do marketing or how do I build product, product or how does pricing work? You probably nailed it at that level. And if you haven't, you're constantly like developing it. It's always, always people. Whereas if you are someone at a million dollars, kind of a hundred thousand to a million dollar revenue, what's your biggest problem? It's almost always marketing. Yeah. That's fascinating. You, you know, it's, it's interesting to align with that data point. I think there's been um, one, one, uh, one, one uh, class at, uh, at the business school uh, that was kind of jokingly called a touchy feely, but it was kind of about you know interpersonal dynamics and focused a lot on the people issues, whether it's hiring or building a team. And it was uh, it was not seen as a class that you would you would uh, celebrate in your kind of think of the most about in your five year reunion, but it would be the one that you would think the most in your ten year reunion, fifteen year reunion, and twenty year because in the, as you're growing, whether it's a entrepreneurial business or a larger business. At some scale, the kind of the people issues are like become more and more prominent. And so the more skillful you are at you know selecting and motivating your team, the, the bigger it is. And so that that's but that's a skill, right? Like in a lot of like at some point, like some people that are kind of entrepreneurial by nature are a little bit um contrarian and maybe you know have not exercised that muscle um in in some contexts as well. Uh, and kind of have thrived by their contrarian nature to a degree. And so here you have to kind of, how do you build a community? Uh, how do you build kind of a, a, a larger scalable organization becomes well, a challenge. Is that something that you see as well? It also just takes a, it takes a long time because you have yeah. to build EQ. You have to learn how to deal with people and manage people. And now they will have a different personality to you because you're the one that owns the business i'd say it's for me personally it's one of the hardest things not never been able to like master it if you said to someone hey i need you to learn how to be the best manager in the world you have six months that's basically impossible because you have to learn eq if i said you need to be the best person in the world at facebook ads you have six months that's almost objectively possible because it's kind of like technical you can learn that as a skill but management just has so many different things. And there's also, and obviously there are paid ads as well, but there's variables outside your control. Sometimes the best person that works for you, you could be the, the best manager in the world, but they could just quit because a competitor comes along and offers them double the salary. And while people say it's not all about kind of money and money is not the only motivator, particularly if you study business at school, they'll tell you money is not the sole motivator, but often with employees, that's why people leave. It's like, well, I got paid more by a much bigger company. I'm going there. So sometimes a lot of these things are outside of your control. So you can never really perfect it. And it just takes a a long time. So I always think it's a 
a challenge, but it's one of those things that I think the early you start to hire people and manage people uh, and figure it out, the, the the better. If you never do it, then you're never going to build a. So it's a it's a skill and it's a it's, and it's acquiring skill and and you know I think you know, I want to throw it in and you could probably have more pattern matching that I do, but I certainly think one of the things that happens when you become a parent uh, is that, for example, it forces you to grow up uh, because, you know, you, you, you can, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are impatient. That's why they want to change things, move things, but you like being impatient with a kid is pretty, um, <laughs> is pretty inefficient, you know, a parenting strategy. And so it help forces you to look inside yourself, you know, see what's triggering you, what, what's going on because you can't blame the kid. Um, and that's a, like some maturing process, right? Like it takes uh, kids to help parents grow up as adults, right? And become less, you know, address their own childish, you know, hang out from their childhoods. And maybe that's an ongoing life process. It does feel like a little bit of, you know, the, the journey of entrepreneurship forces you to address these sort of things uh, inside yourself, right? Like how do you deal with certain fears, certain preconceptions? How do you overcome challenges? Are you finding that the this varies by some factors? So, like, do you see differences between entrepreneurs who you know who are parents and and, and not? Do you see differences um, maybe between venture backed businesses and how they approach things versus the ones that are bootstrapped? Well, you know, have you like because again, I think you have the probably the most fascinating prism of working closely with founders of so many businesses at different sizes, you know, have you seen these things that don't make it in the report, right? That are a little bit more kind of personality uh, connectors. It's a good question. I don't know if I've ever thought about the correlation between being a parent and being a good manager. My immediate reaction is I don't think there's much cor correlation and I don't have kids. So I'm not really one to talk, okay. but I think yeah. a lot of people are just bad parents. So <laughs> just because you are a parent doesn't necessarily doesn't make you translate good one, yeah. to translate to being a good manager and i'm sure also that all of these things could be true you could be a bad parent a good manager and i so i think a lot of ceos for example like stereotypically are bad parents not really around that much but also there's some ceos and business owners who are fantastic managers and probably also great parents so i don't yeah. necessarily think you haven't found that connection mm -hmm. my immediate my immediate answer would be no i think between venture founded and self-funded I would say somewhat anecdotally, if you have outside funding, I'd say you're more likely to take objective decisions when it comes to your team because you're accountable to your investors and your board. You're going to be a little bit less emotional. So if you've got that person who you know you need to let go in your bootstrap self-funded business, maybe you, you won't do it or you'll procrastinate a little bit because you're not, you don't want to make that decision because it's like, oh, it's your baby, it's your business. But in the venture funded company, you know you have a board meeting with kind of your kind of investors, and you have to explain why someone is underperforming. If you don't fire them, the board are going to fire them for you, and they're probably going to fire you as well. In a lot of cases, so I think people tend to be a little bit more objective. And also, if you've raised money, generally that means your growth expectations are higher than in a self funded business. So often you need to be a little bit more, not necessarily ruthless, but you just need to hire more people. It might be that the equivalent self-funded business owner is planning to hire 20 people next year to hit their goals, and the VC-funded company needs to hire 200 people. It's impossible to hire 200 people if you're planning on managing all of them yourself, and you're going to interview all of them yourself, you're going to do all the recruiting. That's physically impossible. You need a HR or like people function within your organization. 20 people, that's a little bit different. So I'd say anecdotally at least VC funded founders do tend to approach it a little bit more objectively um but i don't necessarily have any data to back that up that would just be my my immediate thought and so generally when you're vc backed um you some degree like this accountability that you mentioned right whether it's to board you know or expectations to return the money to the investors what what do you think it kind of you know does um when it comes to exits, right? Like, because obviously right now, a lot of companies have, you know, raised at, you know, attractive market valuations, you know, reality may be setting in. 
uh, like you said, the the life changes, entrepreneurial journey changes. And are you seeing patterns where investors are preventing certain deals from happening? Um, you know, people don't like to talk about that typically. So without naming names, you know, what are you seeing and what would be kind of the warnings for, you know, entrepreneurs who maybe don't have a, you know, VC scale billion dollar exit business, right? But have a good business or passionate about it is, you know, and is that, uh, is getting VCs, you finding, helping them, hurting them in this particular environment and any sort of types of VC arrangements you see are particularly damaging to entrepreneurs and frankly, like the scalability of the company, the survival of the company or the kind of finding a home for a company and its customers, because a lot of entrepreneurs want to find a good home uh, for their customers as well. Yeah, I'd say on average, the VC involvement will hinder a company in the current environment. We see a lot of businesses where, so we talk about like how the exit environment has changed over the last couple of years yeah. and good businesses quantity like valuations have been quite stable hasn't really changed a huge amount vc funded value so the, the valuation you raise funding at has completely changed so but it, it might be and i don't have a huge amount of experience in this space but it might be on the same terms a couple of years ago to exit your business it would have been worth 40 million and today it's still worth 40 million but raising money you might have raised money at 100 million but today you're raising money for that same business at 30 million valuation so it's a drastic difference in valuations and where vcs then hurt businesses is they've invested at a high valuation or valuation more than the business is worth the business itself is great so if it's self-funded 100 percent control from the owner they can happily no sell or exit that business yeah. it would be great been the vc funded Let's say you've raised that a hundred million dollar valuation, your business is only worth fifty million. So objectively, you've still built a great business, still a fifty million dollar business. Um, you can't sell it because often the terms you have with the VCs means that the founders in those companies are walking away with nothing. Nothing. So they yeah. generally yeah. might as well stay around, get paid their salary, find other ways to make money, and that that company just won't exit. So there's a lot of great businesses at the moment that can't exit because of the valuations they raised up. That's not necessarily the fault of the VCs. But it's kind of just it's just the model. It's just the model to the VC model, mm. to your, your your point. Um and it's 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 difficult. We see a lot of companies at the moment coming through that we would love to represent, we would love to sell, but they're just not viable. So something needs to change. I don't know what that is, but it seems like the new generation of companies raising money in the current market, so say 2023, where valuations are, let's say, let's say the word is more realistic, valuations are a bit more reasonable, a bit more realistic. I think those companies are actually going to do a lot better over the next five to 10 years because they're going to have more ex exit options because that, that uh, company worth 50 million, instead of raising it at 100, they raised it 20. So if you exit your company 50 and you raise it 20, in almost all cases, that's going to be a profitable exit for everyone involved. But the challenge, obviously, with VCs is often the scale of exit they're looking for is significantly larger. They invest right. at a twenty million valuation. They, they need two hundred. They, yeah, yeah, they need at least two hundred to be yeah to be worth it. So your fifty million dollar exit, I would say that's a fantastic outcome. I think a lot of people involved would, but the VCs sat there like, well. So yeah, essentially, essentially, this is not loss. returning my fund, right? Like this is, and so it, exactly, what does this do for companies? Because I, I think one of the things that we've noticed, because you know, we start, we we started with enterprise customers, and we bootstrapped the business, and it was really like, really interesting that some com companies they said, well, no, you need to go and get validation from these, you know, VCs, right? So we could we could do business with you, right? Um. And eventually we found ways around it and they kind of believed in the model or they had the pain big enough to overcome that. But it was a really interesting surprise for me because I, I could sort of see what you're describing, which is once you get on the VC model, you're a lot more dependent on the VC as a customer almost because a customer of capital. And you may do things that are not necessarily optimal for that customer. And uh, you may kind of go 
hyper growth. You may get away from enterprise customers and serve the whole market, trying to go for a much bigger market, right? You like you will do all sorts of things to fit into the VC growth model um, that may not be the same motivation, may not be the same pace uh, elsewhere. And again, sometimes it aligns perfectly, right? And sometimes what's great for the VC is great for the customer, great for the business. It does work well if you have a product market fit and that you could scale and grow, but there's all these buzzwords about hyperscaling uh, that a bunch of businesses that didn't have good economics started hyperscaling, you know, spending $10 to, to get $1 in revenue, you know, and just kind of like that was rah, 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 and everybody was celebrating it. Obviously it's not in fashion now. And, and so guide us a little bit of like, what is an entrepreneur, right? Like you're kind of a steward of your mission. You really have, I, you know, in my view, your primacy should be to the customers who place their trust in you. And then investors are kind of there to support that and grows for that. And ideally it's aligned. How do you, how do you maximize your ability to um, kind of maintain that um, longevity, so to speak, for the customers, even after the business gets an exit, right? Because you, you're seeing these, right? Like, and probably I, I wonder, you know, like what happens to some of these businesses? Do they go on, you know, do, is there a better home for the customers inside the new company or it's just kind of a acqui hire or some sort of a tuck in, you know? And I think for me, like uh, it would be non-starter to put, put our customers in a situation where they get worse off from some kind of exit. And I wonder if a lot of entrepreneurs feel like that at the beginning, but end up making suboptimal decisions uh, that lead to that down the road. Yeah, I think firstly, you never know. Right. There's the, the the best planned acquisition in the world could be a terrible outcome for customers and the team, or the most chaotic acquisition that should never close and manages to get over the line could be a fantastic outcome for everyone. So I've over the I mean, our, our team have closed over fifteen hundred deals. I've given up trying to guess which ones are going to do best in the future post acquisition. The ones I thought would be, oh, I'm not sure about that one. And now the biggest businesses and the ones where, um, like I thought they would do really well. Maybe they're not, they're not doing so well. So firstly, you never know. Secondly, fundamentally, if you're the founder of a business and you're selling, you, I think, yes, it's important to do right by your customers and your team, but the responsibility is also to yourself and your own family. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can be, I think where founders go wrong is if they're making preconceptions around the decisions the acquirer is going to make mm. and preempting whether or not they, they agree with that. So may, maybe the acquirer is going to come in and increase prices and the founder says, oh, well, I don't agree with increasing prices because my target market is small business owners and they haven't got any money. Um, so I think preempting what the buyer is going to do is not a good idea. Secondly, if you are going to sell your business, you need to accept the fact you are selling your business. It's no longer yours anymore. Can you do things to protect your team? Definitely. So all the time we will negotiate agreements where the acquirer has to keep the existing team for X months post-sale. Maybe they get a bonus on an exit. Maybe they get severance if they're let go quite quickly. But we can always make sure the team stay around. Often there'll be covenants around existing customers as, as well. So if there's a performance element of the deal. So any sort of future payment from the buyer to the seller, often the buyer will have certain conditions they have to stick to. So if there's like a revenue share agreement between buyer mm. and seller, then the buyer can't just increase prices overnight on all of the customers in case that doesn't work out. So a lot of this stuff can be negotiated up front. I always think, and this has been an entire new conversation, negotiation is a, is a balance. As a founder, I think you have to decide what matters to you the most. And if you say, everything matters to me, I care about these 150 things, then yes, in your textbook world of running a business at business school, maybe that works. You can have all of these demands. But if you're selling a business, you need to be real. If you actually want to sell, you have to be realistic and be somewhat balanced in the negotiation to get a deal done. And that, that might mean there are certain things you care about and certain things you, you don't, if we're being super practical and kind of cutthroat about it. Um, Got it. Yeah, but I mean, post sale, you, you never really know ultimately. Got it. Well, Thomas, you mentioned if you're selling a business. So if somebody's thinking about selling a business at some point down the road, 
Um, how can they find you? You know, you, you, you know, I love your content, you know, where can they find your thought leadership or connect with your team? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you don't find me at an event, which I know is where you found me and we're obviously now both on other sides of the world that we bumped into each other in Paris a couple of months ago, um, go to the fiennesinternational.com website. Like I said, we offer free valuations to anyone thinking about, um, potentially selling a business that doesn't have to be today sometime in the future. If you want to buy a business, you can do exactly the same. You can sign up for our buy list, see the businesses we're representing. Um, follow us on social media. Like we're active on most of the channels. Same with conferences and events. We we travel a lot, so you can usually find our team at an event somewhere in the, the world. So, But yeah, feel free to reach out. Happy to answer any questions, particularly if you mention the, the podcast specifically. I'll, I'll know to get back. Amazing. Thomas, thank you so much. It's been great to have you on. Everybody, I, I, this is like, I learned a ton from this conversation. I hope you've benefited as well. Whether you're planning to sell your business or not, this is like essential business one-on-one class that we just received from Thomas on the world of M&A and, and founder thinking about that. So thank you so much, Thomas. Cool. Uh, we Thanks, wish Alex. you a lot Thanks of success so with your business. Thanks so much.